Welcome, 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 friend. I'm TK, your tour guide to the past, and you are listening to For the Love of History, the podcast where we talk about world history, women's history, and weird history. It is, it is the last episode of the season. Oh, oh, my sweet, sweaty Sobek. I am so sad about it, but it, it, it's fine. It's okay. This season has been a great season. There has been so many things happening in the last 18 weeks. We've been a part of a network for the first time. We have done so many episodes of World History, Women's History, when Weird History. I don't think, was I late on any episodes? One. That's it. Which, I mean, go me. That's great. So many accomplishments. We laughed. We cried. Spicy tea came out. It was great. It was an excellent season. And it's only fitting for such an excellent season that we have an excellent final topic that we talk about. A very highly requested topic. The Druids. The Druids. I'm so excited. But before we get into all of that, let's do our housekeeping. Just so you know that even though this is the last seat season no it's not the last episode of the season there will be some episodes in the interim between season eight and season nine we'll have some guests coming on we'll have some archived episodes being re-released it's going to be great there's still going to be history going on so don't go anywhere don't be too sad there will still be history content while i prepare and rest for season nine. Over on YouTube, there will also be some travel videos, some vlog style videos for your ear holes and your eyeballs. And finally, our last piece of housekeeping is a quick reminder of the For the Love of History app fundraiser that we are doing. So we have the opportunity to make an app that goes along with For the Love of History. It would follow each episode. There will be quizzes connected to each episode. There will be history scavenger hunts there'll be history points that earn you special rewards it's an app that goes with the podcast and enhances it and there'll be community events there'll be all sorts of fun stuff so if you would like more information about that or you would like to donate listen by the way people who donate get to be beta testers and get extra goodies when the pot podcast no when the app eventually launches so just so you know all of that information is in the show notes so if you'd like to donate or if you just like more information on what this app is going to be about you can check the show notes below and with that housekeeping is over and it's time for the druids so grab your best gandalf beard and maybe a walking staff and let's get to it Magic. I love magic. I love Lord of the Rings. I love Aragon. I love Game of Thrones. I love the Belgorad series. I have a, a, a particular soft spot in my heart for the Belgorad series because in high school, I was not the most popular kid. I spent a lot of time in the library. I talked to the librarian who always had a lot of amazing recommendations for me and he pointed out the Belgorad series and I fell in love with this series. I don't know if you know this, but I have dyslexia and so reading was not always super fun for me. I, I didn't really enjoy it and fantasy books were kind of the way that I got into reading and in this Belgrad series I like I fell in love with the characters. I fell in love with the concept. It was amazing. They were my comfort book in high school. They were full of witches, wizards, burglars, and very druid coded characters and from all of my fantasy reading which admittedly in the last 10 years is not as much as I would like it to be I could not tell you exactly what a druid was until now so together today dear one you and I are going to explore the world of druids and separate the fantasy from the factual so let us begin where all good stories do in a dark forest. There is a group gathered around a fire. Some people have long white beards, some are tall and lanky, others are muscular and young, and some look like they would simply blow away if the wind picked up too much. The light in the center illuminates their faces, and there are people from every walk of life, and a representative from every major tribe in prehistoric Europe is there. The druids have gathered to elect leaders, discuss omens, quell fighting, negotiate, teach, and learn. 
However, the contents of their conversations and what went on in these meetings is one of the greatest mysteries of the ages. I need you to get so close to me right now and prepare yourself, okay? I'm gonna tell you something that's gonna make you mad, all right? I was mad when I first learned about it, but we're gonna get through this together. We are gonna go through the five stages of history grief together, okay? The Druids were forbidden from writing down any of their knowledge for their safety and the safety of the public. What we have pieced together about the lives of the Druids is simply our best guess from what mostly the Romans wrote about them. And one of the only maybe contemporary sources we have about the Druids is like a few paragraphs written by Julius Caesar in 60 to 50 BCE. So we do have to take things with a giant pinch of salt because the Roman historians like to embellish, aka straight up just make shit up for their own agenda. <laughs> and they really did not like the Druids. So what I'm saying to you right now is that we know nothing for certain about the Druids. I know. I'm sorry. I was upset too. I was in complete denial. Surely there had to be something, something, anything written by the Druids. But alas, dear one, it's true. So that's the end of our episode. See you later. Bye. Just kidding. Even though we don't have a lot of information about them, there is so much history in this topic and there are so many myths that we need to dispel. So it's time to put on your Mythbuster cap and get down to business. Later on in the episode, we'll talk about the mythology of the Druids. But right now, let's talk about who they really were as far as we know. When you Google Druid, you'll first get a bunch of D&D &D character pictures, but after that, you'll see the most common image of a Druid is a very old man with a long beard, very Gandalf coated, but Druids didn't just spontaneously pop out of the earth all Benjamin Button style as old men. Nay, nay. Druids could be any age and they were not only men. Women were also Druids and they held the same amount of slash level of power as the men did, which baffled the Romans. They were like, oh my God, head exploding moment. <laughs> Although we know that anybody could be a druid, we're unsure of how one became a druid, whether it was being born into a druid family or being selected by other druids. We've got zip zilch to zero clue but what we do know is that the druids were not an ethnicity of people but a social class among the Celts. They could be found all over prehistoric Europe and went from France to Germany and out into modern day Czech Republic. They were like they were all over the place okay they were everywhere and they didn't need to pay taxes nor did they have to fight in wars. Their job was basically to just teach and learn because it took somewhere around 20 years to be a full-blown druid so they had to dedicate all of their time to that learning the learnage <laughs> and because they weren't allowed to write anything down memorization was the only way they could learn however that did not mean that they were illiterate as far as we know they could read and write and do so in latin as well another common misconception about the druids is that they were only religious leaders but according to Ju Ju juicy caesar <laughs> according to juicy caesar salad in his writings about the gaelic wars which he wrote in the third person, which is so, so weird. He's such a deeply weird man. Anyways, he wrote, now I'm just thinking about Julius Caesar, like, being like, yeah, this is some good shit. Like, writing in the third person about his own Gaelic wars. Anyways, I will digress. According to Caesar Salad Man, the Druids conducted business in, quote, divine worship. The due performance of sacrifices, private or public, the interpretation of ritual questions, and they determined respecting almost all controversies, public and private. And if any crime has been perpetrated, if murder has been committed, if there be any dispute about inheritance, if any about boundaries, these same persons decide it. They decree rewards and punishments. And if anyone, either in private or public capacity, has not submitted to their decision, 
they excommunicate him. Which means the Druids were the religious leaders of the Celts, yes, but they also interpreted laws, doled out punishment, stopped fighting among clans, and they were teachers. Education was incredibly important to them, and Druids would often teach the wee children through oral histories and lessons. They had the final say in all matters, and that went for men and women Druids. And this was just baffling for the Romans. Their flavors were fully gasted when they learned that Druid women did all the same things that the men did. They had the ability to divorce, they were making sacrifices, they stopped war, they joined warriors in battle, they did everything. And even though these Celtic tribes had kings and other leaders, the kings would often defer to the Druids because they were the direct connection to the gods and nothing could be done unless the gods were like, yep, you got my stamp of approval. And the only person that could talk to the gods, the only people that had a one-way direct telephone line to the gods were the Druids. That's why they held so much power. The Druids, much like nature itself, were the arbiters of law, both spiritual and corporeal. Mystery is the enemy of history. And in the blank spaces of time, people can come up with all sorts of terrible and fantastical things to fill in the gaps. And we love that when it comes to mythology and fantasy writing, but not when it's used as propaganda in the eradication and defamation of a group of people. The Romans, for all of the great things that they did for humankind, have done equally awful things in the name of what they considered progress and civility air quotes. And I'm, I'm trying to work out if the Romans were a net positive, a net negative, or a net neutral for humankind as a whole, um, but that is a conversation for another time. Like we talked about earlier, the Druids were incredibly powerful in their communities, often stopping wars, mending tribal bonds between the Celts, and being the final decision makers on all things. And when Rome was invading Gaul, which is now modern-day France, the Druids stood in direct opposition of everything that the Romans were trying to do. Rome wanted Gaul, and the Druids had a lot of power over the Celtic tribes, and if given the chance, they might have been able to rally the people together and stop the Roman invasion. One example of the power of the Druids is documented in the writing of the Roman historian Tacitus, is that how you say his name? Hold on. How do you say this man's name? Tacitus. I was right. Tacitus. So this fella Tacitus, okay, the, his, the Roman historian Tacitus wrote, quote, On the shore stood the enemy, dense rows of figures clad in mantles, while among the rows, like furies, women in black clothes with loose hair ran around waving torches. The ubiquitous druids raising their hands to the sky and sending tribal curses so frightened our soldiers that they did not move from the spot as if their legs were paralyzed. They exposed themselves to the enemy's blows. Unfortunately, these brave Druids and Celtic warriors were eventually defeated by Rome, but Rome could not deny the power the Druids had over their people and Roman soldiers. Eventually, the Celts were almost wiped out, and those that survived fled to the north into modern-day England, Ireland, and Scotland. But to the Romans... The battle was not yet over. It wasn't enough to kill the Celts and the Druids. They needed to write them into history as the enemy. Bloodlusting, dark magic wielders who ate their human sacrifices. Yeah, but you didn't think that we would come to cannibalism in today's episode, but here we are. Here we are. Much of mythology surrounding the Druids comes from these centuries-old propaganda. From Julius Caesar Salad to Pliny the Elder to later Irish Catholic historians. And I use the word propaganda because that's exactly what it was. Propaganda is any information, especially of a bias or misleading nature, used to promote a political cause or point of view. When it comes to the Salad Man, his writings on Druids were used as justification of their eradication. The same went for Pliny the Elder, who was 
super obsessed and fixated on their supposed love of blood and gore and human sacrifice. And to that I say the historian doth protest too much. Pliny, maybe it was you who had the weird obsession with blood and gore and guts and stuff and you used the Celts as a, as a scapegoat, but that is a conversation for another time. <laughs> Later on, the Catholic Church also used the Druids as an example to promote the conversion to Catholicism, Catholicism and to be the hype man for St. Patrick, who supposedly converted all the Celts in Ireland. And we don't have time to talk about all these pieces of propaganda, but there are two big misconceptions that I wanted to tell you about that have to do with bloodlust, human sacrifice, and cannibalism that the Druids supposedly did. In Mr. Caesar Salad's writing on the Druids, he mentions that unless the life of a man is offered, the mind of immortal gods will not favor them, and that the Celts, quote, believe the gods delight in the slaughter of prisoners and criminals. And when the supply of captives runs out, they sacrifice even the innocent. What? What? Okay. But from the archaeological evidence that we have, this is a huge over-exaggeration. The debate over whether the Druids and therefore the Celts practice human sacrifice has been hotly debated. Dear one. And as of the recording of this episode, there has been only one clear case of ritualistic sacrifice done by the Druids. And there are four other bodies that have been found that maybe point to some sort of ritual killing, but the only one is like, yeah, this is probably like a ritual killing. And that's the Lindo Man, who was found in a peat bog near Manchester in 1984. Sometime between 2 BCE and 119 CE, this 25-year-old man was fed ritual foods such as mistletoe, which is bananas. He was painted a copper color and then he was sacrificed in a in a, in a gruesome way that I will not describe. I'll leave more information in the show notes about him. But it was clear that he was an important member of society and he lived a good life before his death. And like I said before, this is the only clear evidence we have of ritual sacrifice, which would suggest that Mr. Salad was way over exaggerating and otherizing the Celts. We could totally conquer them. It's actually, we're doing a service to humanity by converting and conquering and killing all of these horribly barbaric people. However, it's very interesting that Mr. Caesar Salad would say that this practice is barbaric because the Romans also ritually killed people. Although they didn't consider burying Vestal virgins alive or drowning hermaphroditic children to be sacrifices. That's what they did. But this is just a case of superiority and otherism, creating a boogeyman to justify their conquest. It was very much a, when we do it, it's fine, but when the barbarians do it, it's no good. It's no, no good. But the salad man was not the only one to talk about the barbarism of the Celts. Air quotes barbarism. Later on, Pliny the Elder takes a step farther and writes the Celts, and more specifically the Druids, practiced ritual cannibalism, eating their enemies' flesh as a source of spiritual and physical strength, which there is no archaeological evidence for, but like any good scary story about the enemy, this tall tale made its rounds in the Roman world and stuck for quite some time. But probably the biggest and most famous of all the Roman tall tales is one that I am 90% sure that you've heard of, and it has connections to Nicholas Cage. <laughs> The Wicker Man. <laughs> We're all over the place today in this episode. So in 2006, we saw a very unhinged Nicolas Cage running around a vaguely Irish coded village in search of a little girl. Also, spoiler alert to come, but also it's been like 20 years since the movie is out. So 
Is it really spoiling the movie? I think not, but I digress. In the movie, we see vaguely satanic, druidic, witchy, culty stuff all throughout the film. And in the end, Mr. Cage gets sacrificed via burning alive in a giant man statue made of wicker. Title drop, The Wicker Man. But TK, where does this wicker man idea come from? Once again, we turn to Caesar Salad himself in his commentaries on the Gaelic War for the first description of this form of sacrifice, the wicker man. He writes, Others have figures of a vast size, the limbs of which formed of osiers, which are a type of tree. They fill with living men, which being set on fire, the men perish enveloped in flames. Okay. Okay, Mr. Sal. I'm going to need you and your anchovy parmesan cheese have an ass self to take several seats and stop drinking the caretech opium wine, all right? You need to slow down because you are drunk and you need to stop writing in your weird third person perspective book, you deeply strange man. There is no other contemporary or archaeological evidence written or otherwise that confirms this statement. And also, if you think about it, the logistics of getting a bunch of people inside a giant wicker man and then burning them alive is banana sandwich bonkers. First of all, getting enough wicker to create a human figure large enough to put several people in is nearly impossible. But TK, what if you only put one person? Okay. The second thing is human-shaped objects don't like to stand on their own and you would have to make the base absolutely massive. Third of all, how are you getting those people inside this very structurally unsound wicker man while they're, I would assume, kicking and screaming? And finally, when wicker burns, it snaps apart. So think about it. All these people burning alive, or even one person, do we think that they're just going to be like, yes... I'm burning, I'm burning in here, this is fine. No, they're probably gonna be like, even if they are willing, they're gonna be involuntarily flailing about because being set on fire is, is not fun. And finally, even if they were drugged or killed before putting them in the wicker man, the weight of those bodies would crush the burning, already snapping, structurally unsound wicker. And finally, And most importantly, we have no evidence whatsoever of a large pile of burnt bodies to to suggest even remotely that this happened. And there has been a group of neo-druids, which we'll talk a little bit more about neo-druids later, who have tried to not burn people alive, but create this type of wicker man structure. And it's just, it just doesn't work. It absolutely does not work. And I'll I'll leave information about that in the show notes below if you want to take a little read but I digress. So I don't know what side salad Caesar was on about but thanks to him this unhinged myth has found its way into thousands of years of writing several books and two movies and we most likely will never know the extent to which the Druids practice human sacrifice but what we can most assuredly know is that their supposed bloodlust and human sacrifice was by no means as wide scale or as exceptional the Romans and Mr. Caesar Salad would have you believe. TK, this is so depressing. Please tell us about something cool. Okay, my delicious little donut, you're right. You are right. You have suffered enough. Let's talk about magic. Ah, mythology. So Irish mythology is super underrated and we are definitely going to be exploring it more in the episodes to come. But for now, let's talk about two druids, a witch killer and a flying blind man from the Bible. The Bible? What? Just wait, okay? So, in Irish mythology, druids were very closely related to gods and goddesses, and in some case, they were both a god slash goddess and a druid. What they're most known for is their nature magic, but they also have other tricks up their sleeves. There was 
one druid that had a magic rock that he would throw into the water and it would turn into a poisonous eel. It's so random. <laughs> that same druid also had a magic helicopter looking thing that he rode on. Other druids could grow and shrink like Ant-Man. Some could control the weather. Others could make entire forests appear out of nowhere. Some had control of animals and would like, what is that, what's that guy's name from Lord of the Rings? Radagast? Yes, that wizard, the brown wizard. The, he, you know, he's very druid coded. Druids would like, you know, do stuff with animals. Not do stuff with animals. They, oh my God. <laughs> Jesus, TK. They would have animals that they can control with their magical powers. Uh, let's move on. Our first magical druid baddie is Bay Kule, who is sometimes referred to as the goddess of sorcery. Her family tree is stacked with badass gods, goddesses, and druids. And she did a bunch of cool stuff, but the thing that she's most remembered for is fighting the Athenian Greek witch, Cameron! Which is so cool, because we have a lady druid and a lady witch battling it out. Ooh, someone needs to make a show about it. I have literal chills. Her story first appears in the Labor Gabala Aaron, which is a collection of Irish myth stories filled with poems and stories about Ireland. It's very loosely historical, most mostly myth mythy oh my god i cannot speak <laughs> in the story she teams up with three other gods to fight cameron and her three sons who were just destroying ireland the other druids did their best but in the end it was bay kula who was the one who could defeat cameron and her brood she makes the sky rain down big ass rocks and brings a whole forest to life to subdue the witch and lock her away forever and woo Ireland is saved. Unfortunately this is pretty much all of the information that we have about her but she is one of the most famous druids of all time and she often appears in magical games and in the neo-druidian religion. Our next druid, however, is arguably one of the most famous. So his name is Magrath, the blind underdog. There is some speculation as to whether he was actually a real person or not. He's kind of a Arthurian character because Christian scholars wrote about him, but we're not exactly sure if he was a real dude. We definitely know that he didn't have mystical powers, but it's still up for debate whether he was an actual human being or not. But nonetheless, his superpowers are really freaking cool. His repertoire of magic includes some very rank breath that can turn people into stone or dry out entire lakes and rivers. He also has a magical horn that will start storms and he can also become a giant. He also is a man of transportation and has a giant ox chariot that is more blinding than the sun even at nighttime. And he rides around in it and ruins the day of any Christian priest that he can come across. He's also the proud owner slash creator of that weird helicopter thing that we were talking about earlier, the Roth Ramach, and he built it with help. Okay, he didn't build it by himself. He had help from Simon, the magician from the Bible. Did you know there was a magician in the Bible? I did not know that there was a magician in the Bible. I feel like I would have paid much more attention to the homily at church if the priest would have just only talked about Simon the magician because magic is cool. But there's definitely a reason why the priest did not talk about Simon the magician in a very positive light because he fancied himself a god because he could float and, and fly and stuff like that and he had magical powers and he was bffs with the druid and this very much upset the apostle peter because god was the only god and anybody who's saying hey i'm a god a false idol and that's a no-no and just as like a little side note this is what happened to simon the magician in the bible so simon was performing magic in some forum area and in order to prove himself to be a god he levitates in the air ab above this forum and the apostle peter <laughs> prays to god to have him stop flying and simon stops flying but doesn't just like gently float down nay nay simon 
full on free falls down and breaks his legs in three places. And thus we have the end of of Simon the Magician. (laughs) Anyways, that's the story of Simon the Magician who built this random helicopter thing with a druid from Ireland, which, why? Why did this happen? Well, I know why this happened. (laughs) Apparently, this particular druid, Magrath, lived through 16 different kings. He was hella old. And he was apparently around Jesus when he was doing all of his stuff in Jerusalem. And he did not like Christianity. In one legend, it says that Mugrath was the one who cut off the head of John the Baptist, which unfortunately cursed all of Ireland and the Irish people for eternity. Is that where the potato famine happened? I don't know. Mugrath was an absolutely unhinged druid, and there are so many stories about him fighting magical battles for different kings, being upset about taxes, so he just like killed people. He was winning all sorts of lands making all of these crazy prophecies and having them come true and just being like overpowered wreaking havoc on all of Christendom because once again he did not like Christianity (laughs) and in one of the final stories about him we have our character Mugrath settling down because even an all-powerful druid you know sometimes seeks the domestic life. He got married to a divine hag called the Kalcha, and they lived happily ever after as hag and druid until one day, Mograth's wandering eye got the best of him, and he started looking at his wife's sister. And his wife became so upset, so enraged, that she threw a massive boulder at him, and he went soaring over half of Ireland, where he landed in a river and died. (laughs) Which is a fitting, chaotic ending for a very chaotic life. The power of the Druids eventually faded because of Roman conquest and Christianity. The legends were still there, but there were no practicing Druids, or at least openly practicing Druids, until those deeply deeply weird human beings. Can you guess? Can you guess who I'm going to talk about right now? I bet you can. One, two, three. The Victorians! Oh, I knew it! I knew you were going to know. These deeply, like, morally flawed human beings, known as the Victorians, started the Celtic revile, revile? No, revival, and began Neo-Drudaism. Drudaism? Yes, Neo-Druidism. Now you can find practicing Druids all over Europe and the United States and Canada, all over the place. We have Neo-Druids from every walk of life, from every corner of the earth. They're a small group, but they are keeping the legends of the Druids alive. And for that, I guess we thank them. Well, dear one, we have come to our final thought, and this is, I I wanted to tell you this fact somewhere in the episode, but I just didn't know where to weave it in. And this final thought has to do with Stonehenge. We're all over the place. The Bible, Nicolas Cage, Julius Caesar, cannibalism, it's... It's everywhere. (laughs) We're all over the place. But Stonehenge has become kind of like a symbol for the modern Druid. There's Neo-Druid gatherings constantly at Stonehenge during the different solstices. However, the common misconception is that the Druids built Stonehenge. And I thought that the Druids built Stonehenge too because there's so much connections with Druids and Stonehenge now. But the Druids have nothing to do with the creation of Stonehenge. Absolutely nothing to do with the creation of Stonehenge because Stonehenge was built in the Neolithic period, which predates Druids at the very least by over 1,000 years, which my flabbers were thoroughly gasted because there are so, you know, like I said, there's so many Neo-Druid Stonehenge activities And while the ancient OG Druids may have used Stonehenge for different ceremonies, what really connected Stonehenge and the Druids is the 1974 Stonehenge Free People Festival, when Neo-Druids and also non-Druids came together to have a celebration at Stonehenge. And from then on, that was just Druids and Stonehenge together. 
connected. But other than the fact that the Neo Druids chose Stonehenge as their location to gather and celebrate, so really, they, the ancient Druids and Stonehenge don't really have anything to do with each other. So that's our final thought. The more you know. <laughs> Well, dear one, that is all she wrote. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode 130. I love it when a season ends on a on a good number like that. Like, I would be sad if it ended at, like, 131. Ooh, that would make me cringe. So we have a nice, rounded, lovely number to end the season on. But remember, we still have some guest episodes. We have some archive episodes coming out. So there will still be For the Love of History each week for you on Friday while I take a little rest and get ready for season nine. So with season eight being over, it's time to go to Instagram and vote for the next round of topics. So within the next few days, there will be a topic poll coming up. So you can go over to Instagram and have your voice heard on what topics you would like to hear in season nine. I hope you enjoyed all of these topics in this season. And if you did, please consider leaving a rating or review. We are trying to reach our 200 rating and review goal for by the end of the year, but it would really be cool if we could do it by the end of season nine. But you know, keeping expectations reasonable. <laughs> So if you haven't already, please consider leaving a rating or review. If you have left a rating or a review, you can also use the Spotify comment option where you can leave a specific comment on a specific episode. Let me know what you thought of that particular episode. If you'd like to support the podcast in other ways, you can join us over on Patreon for early releases, ad-free listening, and behind the scenes stuff. Lots of cool things over there. And if you would like, you can go to our merch store and get yourself some lovely, lovely For the Love of History merch. You can see it if you're watching YouTube right now. Look at this. It's so freaking cute. But just you being here is support enough. I really appreciate you joining me each week. Thank you so much. I hope that you take care of yourself during this interim. Drink your water. Let's take a sippy sip together. Delicious. Go outside, touch some grass, do something that makes you happy. Be kind to yourself. And I'll see you in season nine, dear one. Okay, I love you so much. Bye. <laughs> Focus, focus, don't be dark. Anyways, okay. Hello, it's me. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Magic. I look at my life. Do, 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 do. Ready. Oh, we're here. We're here. Okay. Gonna hunt a little yicket on. We're gonna put a little yicket. When I was a child, I called lipstick yicket. Garage band, where are you? Garage band. Leber Gabella Aaron. The Middle Irish title of a loose collection of poems. Okay. Leber Gabala Aaron. Oh no. Leber Gabala Aaron. But I did. I used to call lipstick Yiki. 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 Such a good name. Okay, how's this looking? I have a cheese hair clip in my hair today. It's a cheese. Okay, there's a cat. Teddy, how did I know it was gonna be you, Ted? How did I know? How did I know it was gonna be you? Yes. What are you trying to do, spaghetti girl? Are you attempt? What are you? Uh, do you want to go in the crack behind the couch? Dolce and Gabbana, Fendi and Nidana, Cameron Davis, Shrimp. Gabbana, Erin. Lebor Gabbana, Erin. Le Lebor Gabbana, Erin. Oh, I think I think this is a good place to start. Look at my hook size shirt. I was gonna save it for Halloween, but I I just can't. Look at how cool it is. It does make a crazy sound, so 
I'm hoping that that's not going to affect anything. Oh, stop. What are you doing? Anyways, it's a giant skeleton. It's hawk sized giant skeleton, which is really, really cool, which I'm very excited about. Focus, TK Jesus. Jesus. Okay. We're focused. We're ready. Are we ready? Are you ready? Teddy Spaghetti, are you ready? Are you ready? Perfect, beautiful angel baby? Yes. 